timing of meals, it's um, how good the food tastes. And when you've got Prader Willi syndrome, you don't have adequate um, signals from the gut to the brain to say when you're full and when to stop eating. Um, or at least the receptors are not normal so that those signals get through appropriately. So all these other things up above it, at the brain level are what's primarily influencing their appetite. So one of these things that matters a lot, we found out in the past few years um, through work in Dr. Dan Driscoll's lab, is that it, insulin is a big player in the development of these nutritional phases. So this is um, individuals with Prader-Willi syndrome in the yellow and their typical weight siblings in the blue, and which many of you siblings in the room were in this study, um, and I made you drink blue cola, which you loved. Um, and then the pink um, is individuals with um, other causes of obesity. And what you can see is that the normal weight kids with Prader-Willi syndrome in nutritional phase 2A, so the phase where the weight starts to go up without a change in calories, have high insulin levels, just as high as kids who are severely overweight and had prediabetes, suggesting that although the weight is normal, insulin is a key player in the reason for weight gain and subsequently, excuse me, subsequently for hunger in the future. So this is what we say to our patients, those of you who have seen me, which are many of you, you've heard this mantra over and over again, but I'm going to say it anyway for those of you who haven't, and that is insulin is released in response to sweet taste. It is not necessarily ingesting the sweet. It is putting it on your tongue. So sugar-free gum that tastes sweet, you know, sugar-free drinks, those kind of things, things that taste sweet, hit the taste buds, there's a direct signal to the hypothalamus, which then subsequently results in insulin release from the pancreas, inappropriate insulin release from the pancreas when you have power release syndrome. And so we know that the regular consumption of sweet tasting things, whether that be drinks or food, primarily drinks in the younger kids, right, because they don't like water, so people flavor the water to make it more palatable. But if you do that repeatedly, then it actually ends up causing the problem to be even more significant as kids get older because it not only causes the insulin production, but it alters the gut microbiome. And so the gut bacteria changes, and what that does is it makes us resistant, more resistant to the insulin that we produce. And so you get a higher blood sugar, which gives you more insulin, which is, uh, makes you gain more weight, and it just becomes a vicious cycle. Um, insulin acts on its peripheral receptors to modulate things such as appetite, which we've talked about, reproductive function, very critically tied to insulin. Body temperature, one of those things people say is part of broader like body temperature tied to insulin. Fat mass, hepatic glucose output, and response to hypoglycemia. So what we've seen is that often adults will have low blood sugars and they'll say, I don't feel very good, and I'll check their blood sugar is 26. They're awake and alert and like, do I know, right? And doing a cognitive test, and I'm like, oh, crap. But yeah, we would all be on the floor unconscious, but there's this, this abnormal response to hypoglycemia in someone who's had these abnormal insulin levels their whole lives. Um, both animal and human studies have suggested that artificial sweeteners are no better than regular sweeteners, okay? So non-nutritive sweeteners, it doesn't matter. If it tastes sweet, it's bad for your body when you've got product relation right before you're a woman over 40 um, because it causes us to have increased insulin levels. Um, and so in one study, those who consumed non-nutritive sweeteners um, had like 20% higher insulin levels and also cleared that insulin more slowly from their body, thus meaning that the insulin hung around longer, thus converting more of the food that people were eating into fat. Not good. Not what we want. So this is a picture that those of you who have been in my clinic, when your kids are old enough, you know I show your kids this picture because it's one of my favorites. And it shows the effects of the insulin on the body in someone with Prader Willi syndrome, or women over 40. And what it shows you is that high insulin levels can be responsible for things like adult and cognitive function. Okay, we don't want that. That's not good. They can increase your appetite. We know that. Hypogonadotropic hypogonadism, again, one of the things that's thought to be part of Carter willi syndrome. Abnormal body temperature regulation and poor response to hypoglycemia. And mood disorders, so emotional lability. So a lot of you, as your kids get into teenagerhood, say to me, oh my god, my kid cries at the drop of a hat, you know, I don't know what's wrong with them. Well, think about what happens during insulin, we automatically, or during insulin, during puberty, we automatically get more insulin resistant part of our lives for all of us, but when you've got Prader-Willi and it's already 
you know, expanded, it makes things even worse and it can really exacerbate those mood disorders. So, as you all as parents know, there's a lot of people out there that want to give you input to your kid's diet, and they're mostly on Facebook. And so, you need to understand what you're saying, um, that, that growing kids really do need adequate calories um, for growth um, and muscle mass and that kind of stuff. So, any kind of diet, any kind of fat diet, a low protein diet, a low carb diet, a low fat diet, these are not diets that help individuals with Prader Willi syndrome. You really need a well-balanced Mediterranean diet when you're a young child um, growing with Prader Willi syndrome to help have appropriate body composition. So, you know, the other thing that I thought was particularly interesting was this study, um, the last line on the side, where there was a study that looked at typically developing kids who were starved for one reason or another with one macronutrient or another, you know, whether it was neglect or, or just poor feeding choices or whatever. And what they found was that those who don't get adequate amounts of all the macronutrients between zero and five years of age have a 41% increase in aggressive behavior when they are eight years old. So, aggressive behavior, when you're eight years old, may be related to what you did when you were a baby. Okay, if you don't give the kid adequate calories, then you can have problems with behavior. Now, I'm not saying that's the only problem, I'm just saying it, it can correlate. And a 51% increase in aggressive behavior by the age of 17. So, the one thing I get always asked is, what's the magic weight? Where do you want my kid to be? We're unhappy with the weight. There is no magic weight. I don't care what the weight is. The weight is individual for each child. We tell parents all the time, my dietitian Mike is back there in the back of the room and he will attest to that, <laughs> that we tell parents all the time, don't freak out about where your kid is on the growth chart. We want to make sure they're eating a healthy, well-balanced diet and they're growing and they've got muscle. And so this is one of my favorite examples. And uh, at, I think she was about 11 in this picture. You can see how she looks. She looks really thin, right? I mean, she doesn't look overweight. And her weight is actually at the 90th percentile, okay? So does that matter? No, it does not. Because look at her. So if your doctors are telling you, oh my god, the weight's gone up to the 95th percentile and you're freaking out, look at your kid. Just look at your kid. Feel your kid. And say, okay, is my kid all fat? And that's why their weight's at the 90th percentile? Or are they muscular and do they look lean? Because that's a big difference. It matters what your kid looks like and how healthy they are, not the number on the chart. So endocrine issues, because I'm an endocrinologist, I put my slide in there and plug that a little bit. 80 to 85% incidence of birth hormone deficiency in childhood. Um, in adulthood, that number is debated um, and is thought to be closer to about 50%. Um, hypogonadism is thought to be present in about 87% of individuals with Barbara syndrome. Central hypothyroidism is somewhere between 15 and 25% depending on the study. And adrenal insufficiency in approximately 10%. The numbers range from 0% zero, zero have it to 60% have it, which are really broad numbers. And the reason for that is the testing is not standardized. And all the studies have been done using different types of stimulation testing. And so, um, so it gives you really different numbers. Um, and there is no consensus yet on what's the right test to do or when is the right test to do. And hypoglycemia present about 12%. Um, endocrine monitoring, people always ask, when should we have you know, all of our endocrine stuff checked? This is our recommendations, is that you check thyroid, especially when they're younger, twice a year. Symptoms of hypothyroidism include increased daytime fatigue, constipation, weight gain, all things that happen when you've got parvalism or when you're less than three. So, we ask you to check a little bit more frequently at less than three. And then, if you have a family history of hypothyroidism, we ask you to continue to monitor um, more frequently, but otherwise just once a year if they, unless they develop symptoms. Um, adrenal, we usually say to check the 8 a.m. cortisol just to see that it's sufficient, but then the really important test is when they're in the hospital. Like if they're really sick and they're in the hospital, they're undergoing anesthesia for surgery, they're in a car accident, got bit, something like that. We want you to have their cortisol level checked to make sure that they can produce adequate cortisol levels in response to the stress of an illness or a surgery. Go to we're going to talk about in just a minute because they're, they're fun to talk about. And then blood sugars you check in infancy or, um, or older if, you know, if anybody is concerned. All right, growth hormone. We all know growth hormone. Um, growth hormone improves body composition, decreases fat mass, improves muscle mass, 
improves IQ. Um, Charlotte or uh, Anita Hogan's group showed this several years ago that those with the most severe cognitive delays actually benefit the most cognitively from being on growth hormone therapy. In adults, there is still benefit, and I know PWSA is working with FPWR and some other groups to try to get the FDA to recognize the importance of growth hormone therapy for adults with moderate delay syndrome um, because it is really important. It improves cognitive performance, cognitive, cognitive flexibility, behavior, self-control, self-esteem, lots of stuff, really important stuff. So um, parents are working very hard to try to get the FDA to recognize this and improve it for continuation of therapy after the kids are done growing. I had like 50 different titles for the slides and I decided to go with male hormones versus sex, which is what I was going to call it, and I said that before form said male hormones. Um, you can give, um, you give the boys HCG or testosterone when they're infants to help their penile length and their scrotal sac. Um, Orpiopexin, which is, you know, tethered down to the testes and scrotal sac, is the gold standard for treatment of undescended testes, which are very common. About 60% of babies with bodily syndrome will have voice, will have undescended testes. However, the data show that six years after just doing an orpiopexin, only 40% of the testes are still in the scrotal sac and in the right place. If you give HCG first, um, and then do orpiopexin, the number increases to 76% being in the right place six years later. So um, the recommendations currently are to give HCG. 23% of those who get HCG will have spontaneous descent of the testicles with no need for surgery. The rest <coughs> will need surgery in addition to the HCG, but at least it will result in the testes remaining in the right place and everything looking normally as the kid is growing up. Um, interestingly, this is my favorite part of this talk, is that those who had HCG in infancy um, have now been found to have normal and have been in testosterone levels as they grow up and become adolescents and young adults. In other words, fertility is possible. Um, they have normal germ cell containing tubules. This is something we are now checking in boys as they are adolescents and young adults because uh, that um, we all thought that men couldn't, with probably couldn't father babies, but now we know that there things have changed and we need to, to at least be aware and you know use caution you know for our young men as they grow up they should use caution. Um, female hormones um, are the same as male um, in that they have um, a variety of reproductive issues um, and um, Israeli group looked at reproductive function in 61 girls <laughs> um, with Prader-Willi syndrome, um, I found that the primordial follicle pool of eggs in the ovaries and the number of small antral follicles, again, looking at, at reproductive function, how many eggs did their ovaries you know, produce, um, those were conserved, were normal. Um, it was the maturation of the follicles and the <coughs> development that was different um, from the general population. However, some girls, and girls, as you all know, can go through puberty, can, um, birth children, um, and puberty onset is the same in terms of age, but it is slightly delayed in terms of progression. Sexuality to me is a very important issue. When I started doing this 20 some years ago, I was told that because of the hypogonadism, people with broader relay syndrome didn't really express sexuality, and that's really not true. The more I got to know patients and got to talk to them, and I realized that they are people, just like we are people, everybody's people, you know? And so we, we asked, and I had to do this presentation for the Endocrine Society a few years ago, so we asked around, Half of the adult patients that were interviewed um, reported having been on a date and kissing romantically. They all wished to marry all of the females, not all the females. Smarter, I mean, I did not say that. 77 <laughs> percent um, of the males wanted hormone, had wished they had had hormonal treatment to improve their phallic size. And although sexual development is often slow and delayed, it doesn't mean that their capacity for affection or a sexual or a marital relationship is in any way abnormal, okay? So they still have desire to have relationships, close intimate relationships um, with others. Only 64% of the females wish to marry, so 40% um, wished that their parents had given them hormonal treatment to achieve menstruation. And in adolescence, they said they felt different than their peers because they didn't have periods. Um, and there was no correlation in either gender between hormonal levels and their sex drive. Um, that's right, you'll never screw me back there. 
because individuals with probability are living longer and um, and we expect more independent lives in the future, um, it is important to um, to really address any possible hormonal and endocrine issues and, and treat them um, as early as possible to improve their overall quality of life. Any kind of exercise is good. That's my mantra. Helps weight control, mood, metabolism, bones, all good. Research, this is the fast part of my talk since, you know, I've been talk a long time. Uh, <laughs> um, Research, you know, 10 years ago at this meeting, we really had like only investigator initiated trials. That was it. And now we have a ton of industry trials, as you see out there. And there are three trials that are currently in the phase three um, part of, of trial design. So, in other words, pre FDA approval that are going on right now, um, primarily for the treatment of hyperphagia. You know, the parent groups have driven this. This is all you guys. The parents have, have gone and made this important to industry. They've showed the industry why this should matter. They've talked to industry about their kids and what this is and what this means for their children's lives. And it's made a huge difference because 10 years ago, industry wasn't interested. And now they are. And that's all thanks to all the families. These are the studies that are currently going on. Um, I'm sorry, GLW is still up there. It's close. But the rest of the studies are currently recruiting. That's, that's quite a fair number of studies, I would say, going on right now, and, um, and more are coming. We're being contacted frequently about from companies who are interested in starting studies in probability syndrome. Um, education is also a big factor, of course, and one thing that early um, diagnosis can help and help, right? I mean, so it can help in that we know where the potential pitfalls are, I think it can also hurt if you if you look at your child because of a diagnosis and say, oh well, they're going to have cognitive disability or they're not going to be able to learn or they're you know, it's if you don't do that you know you don't know what your child's ability is none of us do when our kids are babies okay and so you can't preemptively decide what education your child should receive when they go to school and so you know what we encourage people to do is to you know talk with the teachers about curriculum adaptations um, and to you know maybe get a one-on-one -on -one aid if the child's having problems you know with staying focused or staying attending to stuff um, or transitioning but ideally we want kids to be in the least restrictive environment with kids that are typically developing to really model classroom behaviors and learn how to get along in the world because this is what we expect is that they're going to get along in the world. They're going to have colleagues and peers and bosses just like the rest of us. Now, you know, someone who shall remain nameless in this room, I don't see her, I don't glare at her, but told me a few weeks ago that they didn't think there was hope for everybody with Prader-Willi syndrome, that some of the older people there's not hope for, and I disagree with that very, very strongly. I think there's hope for everybody in this room and every age person with Prader-Willi syndrome. With the research going on, I think, well, it may not be possible for the adults to achieve complete and full independence at this point, they certainly can achieve more independence than what they're currently able to have. They can have happiness, they can have fuller lives, they can have careers. I think they can have anything they want with the research that's happening right now and how, what types of issues in the syndrome that it's addressing, these sort of core issues that we've always been told are part of the syndrome are now being able to be treated and that's making a huge difference and will make a huge difference quality of life for all of your children.